Hey, 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 I'm Ian Plant, professional nature and travel photographer, and this is OPG Live. I'm here with Lilia Khalif from Hello. Outdoor Photography Guide, and we've got an exciting episode for you. Exciting mostly because I'm going to describe my most recent photo trip to the American desert. I went out to Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah. I was on a three-week trip, and it was the trip from hell. It was one of the worst <laughs> trips I've ever had. Uh, okay. Not only did I barely make any good photos, grass. I crashed yet another drone. Another drone. Another drone. Yes. This is like See, I told you we need a tally in the background. Yeah. The drones Ian has already destroyed. I think this is the fourth drone that I've destroyed. Wow. And on top Maybe of that, you should learn how to fly a drone better. Is, it, this, is this a user error problem? Well, or? Uh, yeah, I guess so. It wasn't really the flying the drone that was the problem here. It was putting the propellers on correctly. Mm -hmm. I thought that the propeller was on just fine, and the drone took off. <laughs> Usually if a propeller's not on right, it, you'll know right away because the drone will just not take off. Uh, but it took off, it flew around for a few minutes, and then all of a sudden, I got on my, my video screen a warning saying there was a propeller error, which, was, <laughs> which I thought was kind of funny that it was telling me this because I, at the same time I saw the video feed beginning to spiral uncontrollably. <laughs> so it's not like I, I could have done anything. It's not like I could have said, oh, propeller error. Let me just yeah. fix that by pressing this button. The propeller had spun off. It was basically just letting you know that it was going to be, it was going to crash. Yeah, yeah, basically what it should have done is just said, ah! <laughs> Because my, you know, that was the sound I made as I watched my drone spiral and hit the ground, uh, smashed, uh, fell about 100 feet, smashed on the rocks, and I ran over. And amazingly enough, I was able to get it to fly again. The bottom oh, part of the drone smashed. So it was not all lost. Not all lost, except once I got it up in the air, the camera wouldn't stop doing this. Just moving oh. up and down randomly. So unless I was like really quick and press the button when it would it get to, yeah, there was just awesome. no way I could do any photography. So, By the way, Anya says, no, not another drone. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a graveyard of drones. Actually, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, letting this drone go completely to the other side in an exciting fashion because it still flies. I may end up shooting a video where I fly the drone into a brick wall and smash it completely. So that may be something you can look forward to. That'll be a fun video to watch. Destroying. And so after I got my, my drone destroyed, I thought that, well, okay, this is probably the worst thing that's going to happen to me on the trip, except a few days later, I got food poisoning. <laughs> How could it get much worse than that? You're crashing your drone, you're getting food poisoning. Yeah, so... What did you I, eat that gave you food poisoning? Um, well, I, I don't want to name any names, but name there's names. A, Be shady. Well, there is a certain restaurant in Page, Arizona that is a chain restaurant that usually is a pretty reliable place to go in and get breakfast, lunch, dinner, anytime you want during the day. Uh, but this particular restaurant didn't really end up being as reliable as I thought it would be. Yeah. So me and I was out photographing with my friend, Zach Mills, fellow photographer. You might recognize Zach from some of the instructional videos that I've done. He was with me in Vanuatu and in Kenya when we filmed those instructional videos. Uh, and it was better to see him there in his full glory as opposed to seeing him lying in the fetal position uh, <laughs> once the food poisoning hit. And uh, for the first five hours, it was just Zach who was sick. Uh, and uh, so the whole time I was rather smugly saying, well, I'm feeling just fine. <laughs> And You're then giving it yourself a, bad karma there. I, it, it was going to yeah. come back to bite you. It, it came back to bite me. And so we were out of commission for a few days. And then he flew home. Uh, and then I had one final week to try to make some photos. During this whole time, I'd been out for two weeks after crashing my drone, getting sick, uh, being out of commission half the time that I was in the field. I hadn't really made more than one or two decent photos. So in that final week, I needed to rally and make some photos. And I tried very, very hard, but I didn't have that much luck with... Uh, photo conditions. And so I, it wasn't exactly the most productive trip I've ever had. So I basically came back home after three weeks with my, with my tail between my legs, but my misfortune is your entertainment. So it's what I'm going to do experience too. Maybe you grew some character on this trip. <laughs> well, that's about the only <laughs> thing I got out of it. And, and character is something that I sorely need. So that's probably a good thing, but I did make some photos from the trip that I liked. And that's the key lesson for today is perseverance. Uh, I go on a lot of photo trips and some of them, sometimes you feel like you've got great luck and everything is going wonderful and you're making great photos left and right. Sometimes you go on trips where everything seems to go wrong. And the best thing you can do is to, as they say, get back on the horse and keep on trying. Uh, even though you don't make great photos on a bad trip, 
Uh, you can still learn a lot. You can practice your art and your craft. Uh, you can learn about new areas and getting new experiences. And it can better prepare you for when you return to that location again so that you have a better chance of succeeding. So I did my very best. I got back on the horse after the food poisoning was done. Silver lining, at the very least. And I did, make some, I did make some okay photos. So I'm going to review some of the photos from my trip right now. Lily is going to go uh, move us over. You're pressing the magic button to... Magic uh, button. Yes, the magic button to... And so after a week of shooting, I was having some tough luck with the weather and I ended up in Page, Arizona, which is in the heart of the Navajo Nation. And the Navajo have done a great job preserving some of the most beautiful uh, desert areas on the planet, including a bunch of slot canyons. Now, most people know about the really famous Antelope Canyon. Antelope Canyon is a place I will not set foot in ever again because it has well, become why not? a, well, it's, it's a beautiful place, but it's become a giant tourist trap. Oh, and it's, okay. I think they've regulated to the point where it's impossible to really kind of go in and do your own photography. You either have to be part of a group if you go into upper Antelope Canyon and you're just shuttled around from location to location and you get a short period of time to shoot. And you're basically just shooting the shots that have been identified by the guides. Uh, it used to be that you'd have more flexibility in Lower Antelope Canyon, but they've continued to restrict it to the point now, I think they're not even allowing people to go down there with tripods. And tripods are really, wow. really necessary when you're photographing slot canyons because it can be very dark inside the slot canyons. And if you wanna get sharp photos, you're gonna need to do long exposure. So a tripod is really useful. So instead, the, the nation has developed a few alternatives you can go into some of the other canyons that are part of the overall Antelope Canyon drainage system. So one of the canyons I went to this time was a place called Secret Canyon. Which, secret Canyon. Yeah, I know. It sounds exciting. It's not as much of a secret as it used to be, mm. but it's a nice canyon. It's a nice alternative to going to Antelope Canyon. There's a few other canyons that are in the area that you can visit, but I think Secret Canyon is probably one of the, the better ones to go to. And it is similar in some respects to Antelope Canyon. And it's great because you can go in with a smaller group. So it was just me, my buddy, Zach Mills, and a third photographer who we didn't know, who was part of our tour group. So we, you know, we went in there and we had about an hour of photography during some glorious light. And I made this photo. So this was uh, the first good photo I'd made in a week of photography. And at this point, I thought I was, the trip was turning the corner that, you know, despite the fact that I smashed my drone, despite the fact that I had some bad luck with the weather, I was finally making some good photos and I felt that better times were on the horizon. Well, uh, this was the morning, uh, this was the afternoon after we had had breakfast in the morning at this unnamed uh, famous chain restaurant. And uh, later on, the first uh, rumblings of disquiet began in Zach's stomach and then later in my stomach. So it was a turning point for the trip. Little did I know it was about to get much, much worse. Uh, so uh, when I'm photographing slot canyons, basically you get uh, this light that bounces down into the canyons. You wanna be there on a sunny day, the sunnier the better, because what happens is the sunlight hits the top part of the canyon and it, those rocks glow really brightly and they reflect and bounce light deeper into the canyon. And that's what gives slot canyons that famous orange reddish glow. A little purple too. And little, well, so what happens is you're, you're shooting in red sandstone. And so you're getting two kinds of light that are bouncing down into that red sandstone. You're getting that reflected light that I just mentioned, which is you know reflecting off the red sandstone at the top of the canyon. So that is accentuating the color of the red sandstone that's in the shadowed parts of the canyon. So that, that glow ends up making that red sandstone look much more intensely red or orange in color. The purple comes from areas of the canyon that are deeper in shadow. They're not getting that glow light. Instead, the light they're getting is light that's reflecting off the blue sky above. And when you mix blue light with red sandstone, you end up with Purple. Purple. Okay. So I'm always looking for places when I'm shooting slot canyons where you've got that most intense glow and where you also have a lot of areas that are in shadow surrounding those glowing areas. So you get the mix of colors. And for this particular shot, I was shooting up. I found a place in the canyon where the opening, the top of the canyon was mostly blocked. I let in just a little bit of the sky and that creates some flare. Whenever you have a lot of contrast between the brightest and darkest parts of your scene, then your lens is gonna be prone to flaring up in that light. So here, 
that little bit of flare from that bright part of sky helps uh, add uh, a little bit of a, an ethereal mood to the image. It just adds this little bit of brightness in the middle that, uh, that helps give the, the, the image a more magical feel. So I'm always looking for a way to creatively incorporate these sort of uh, lens and equipment uh, failures. Uh, so lens flare is something that most people try to avoid, but I found that you can use it creatively. And this is something that's the topic of my unseeing course, the, the video uh, ebook course that I recently released that you can find for sale on the Outdoor Photography Guide shop. So it's something that uh, this course talks about a lot is using these technical limitations of your equipment to creative artistic effect. So after I made this photograph, uh, then the doom struck. And for five <laughs> days, I was completely out of the commission. The doom. The doom. That's what Zach and I are Did calling it. Did you at least it. have some Pepto-Bismol, a Zantac, something? No, just... Uh, just suffering. Just, just yeah, just a toilet and suffering. And uh, <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure who suffered more, yeah. also the toilet. <laughs> uh, it was it was pretty rough for a while. And uh, then I had to, we had to head back to Phoenix. I dropped Zach off at the airport. He was feeling a little bit better. I was still out of commission for another day or two. Zach's a bit younger than me, so he bounces back from these things quicker, <laughs> I guess. And uh, so after a few days of recovery in Phoenix, I was ready to hit the road again. So I drove up to Utah and I wanted to get into the, the beautiful desert that's up there. I was in Utah in January. So there was a lot of places that I had scouted out. I'd been photographing. I wanted to get back to that desert. I had my new drone. I uh, ordered one. So a short-lived new drone. No, no, no. It's still alive. <laughs> I have not crashed Barely, it. barely. So I, I got back up. I got back in the saddle, as they say, and I headed up to Utah. And the first place I stopped was the goosenecks of the San Juan River. And I flew my drone over the goosenecks and for this next photo to get an aerial view. And this is a really stunningly beautiful area that is revealed best, I think, from above. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see all of the striations in the rock uh, all of these beautiful geological formations and colors. And it's really quite an incredible area. It's, it's a place I want to go back to photograph again because, you know, I focused my efforts on the famous goosenecks, but it was other parts of the canyon and the river that really caught my eye. There was a lot of beautiful patterns and colors. And I, I really need to go back and uh, work very extensively in that area because I think there's a lot of potential and I want to kind of avoid that classic shot of the goosenecks. Uh, you know, the goosenecks are something that are a famous area that have been photographed a lot. And I'm beginning to see aerial shots with people's drones. Uh, and this is going to be a pretty obvious composition for everyone. And so the end result is everyone's going to end up having the same shot of the goosenecks eventually. So I'm going to be going back there, but looking for the less obvious compositions, the stuff that people aren't shooting, uh, and trying to find some interesting, unique compositions from the air of this incredibly beautiful and colorful location. And then after the goosenecks, I went back up into the south central area of Utah that's mostly BLM land. Uh, it's really out in the middle of nowhere. And there are all of these clay badlands all around this area, these eroded uh, bentonite formations. And it's really quite stunning because there's no one out there. And you got the whole place to yourself. You're in the middle of the wilderness and you have all these options for photography. And this is where I really love getting my drone up in the air and taking photos. So this is another drone shot. This was a formation I had scouted out and I shot this at sunset when the last light was hitting the formations in the foreground and then the mountains in the background and there were some stormy skies. These are the kinds of conditions that I love. Uh, I love having uh, stormy skies in the backgrounds for my landscape shots because they add a lot of drama and character and if you're lucky, those skies will light up at sunrise and sunset and get a lot of color. So there's a lot of fantastic opportunities when you've got mostly cloudy skies, as long as there's a gap in the clouds near the horizon, either where the sun is setting or where the sun is rising, you can get some really stunning lighting effects. Uh, so I did a lot of shooting in this area. Uh, a lot of times I would get higher up with my drone and look down. Uh, the main challenge was finding parts of the desert that hadn't been tracked up by cows uh, because this is BLM land. There's a lot of uh, ranchers who uh, who let their cows roam in this area. So a lot of my shots, I was zooming in later to find all these cow prints all over the place. Uh, so I had to be very careful to try to find the areas where the cows hadn't been. 
But there were so many beautiful patterns and colors. This rock is really colorful. You get all these pastel yellows and pastel blues, and you can accentuate that color contrast by being very choosy when you trigger the shutter. So this particular shot was a photograph I made at the very end of sunset when the last light was hitting the very top of this, this triangle yellow peak that was down below me. So the warm light of sunset was accentuating the native yellow color of the rock. And then the rest of the scene, which was kind of this whitish bluish clay, was falling deep into shadow. So it was getting light from the blue sky above. So it takes on a more blue color. It intensifies that blue color. So by choosing my moment carefully, where I was shooting in a mixed light situation, I was able to accentuate the color contrast in the scene and to create a complementary color scheme that makes this more colorful and exciting for viewers. Here's another example of some of the patterns that I found while I was exploring this area with my drone. And uh, the erosion that's created whenever there's any flash flooding is, is really characteristic, it's very unique, and it gives you an infinite variety of composition. So that's what I really love about photographing in this particular area, uh, or a lot of areas in the desert that are similar to this, is that you can just get the drone out there and you can find all these interesting patterns and compositions and chances are no one will ever photograph those same places again or find those same compositions. It's a very unique way of expressing yourself artistically. Uh, this is one of my personal favorites. I just love the way the erosion patterns uh, come in from the lower left and right hand corners and reach like fingers into the center of the composition. So there was a, you know, a hint of color here, that yellow blue color contrast, but it was a pattern here that, that really uh, struck my eye and, and got me interested in this composition. Now, as it turns out, there were a lot of cow hoof prints in the shot, so I could go <laughs> in and clone out all these tiny little hoof prints. Uh, you didn't want so, the cow tracks in there? Well, so, <laughs> they, they, you know, they weren't that obvious. It was hard to see them unless you zoomed yeah. in. But once you saw them, that's the only thing you could see. Oh, they were distracting. Very distracting. I mean, because they, they would be like cutting across all of the erosion patterns. So I had to spend some time going there and taking out these individual little cow prints uh, and clean up the image. But it turned out to be relatively easy. Photoshop has got some really powerful the tools. Tool. Yes, exactly. You can use the clone stamp tool or the patch tool or the spot healing tool in uh, Photoshop. And they uh, more often than not do a great job. You can't even tell. That well, I can't even did. tell. If you told me there were cow prints in here at one time, I would not be able to identify it. <laughs> well, there you go. We have we have Lilia's stamp of approval. I'm so living proof. Yes. <laughs> so this is actually one of my favorite aerials from the trip. It's uh, not as colorful or as bold as some of the other compositions I shot, uh, but I, I just really like the way it, it comes together. It's a more subtle pattern. Uh, here's another example of the colors and the patterns you can find in the desert. And usually I would just drive around until I saw some interesting uh, color formations, you know, hills or maybe a little bit of a canyon or something like that. And then I'd get the drone up and, and sure enough, you'd find all these greens and purples and blues and reds. And then I would just look for interesting color combinations to bring it all together to make an exciting composition. So here's another example. Uh, that's uh, the great thing about the desert in the American Southwest is there's so much color. It, it just never ceases to amaze me. Uh, how much of a kaleidoscope, a rainbow of color you can find in these places. It's really amazing. And there's a lot of formations that, that rise up from the desert. So once again, I'd be shooting at sunrise and sunset and I would, uh, I'd would i be flying a little lower and I'd have my camera aimed up higher with my drone when I had clouds in the sky because I wanted to incorporate those clouds into the overall composition, get that first light of the sunrise or the last light of the sunset, striking the landforms and have those dramatic cloudy skies in the background. Um, and I'd also experiment with um, uh, flying a little higher and pointing the camera down uh, just to get that landform lit up, uh, surrounded by nothing but shadow. So it creates that interesting color contrast that we talked about earlier. And it creates a really stark contrast between light and shadow and patterns, shapes emerge from that contrast that can be the basis of a composition. And then after, uh, uh, I did all that aerial photography. I spent a day going into this place called Happy Canyon. Did you feel so happy when you went there? I was <laughs> happy because I was not miserable for being sick, first uh. of all. And second of all, it was a beautiful remote area. And I've got a video that I'm going to show you in a bit. It's a preview video of the, the newest free video that will be out on, on OPG in a, in a few weeks 
that talks about my trip to Happy Canyon. It talks a little bit more about slot uh, canyon photography, but it really was a beautiful place. And it was, it was incredibly remote. It was really difficult to get to this spot because mm -hmm. as you'll see from the video, there's this gnarly four by four trail that you've got to take where, where at some places I'm on the side of a 400 foot cliff, just looking down as I'm driving <laughs> over this really rough, rugged stuff. Better not have a fear of heights. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> so it turns out I don't have a fear of heights or falling. I just have a fear of hitting the ground. Mm -hmm. So as long as, <laughs> as long as I don't do that, I'm okay. Just um, fall forever then. Yeah, right, exactly. And, uh, and so it was really remote. I get out to this place and I'm on this bench overlooking the Dirty Devil uh, River, which is this, this beautiful river that cuts this deep canyon uh, through the Utah wilderness. And I'm about four or 500 feet above it on this, this bench would be a fantastic place for camping, by the way. There's no one around. And then I had this long four mile hike to get to this canyon. So I was the only person there. And it was just so beautiful to be in this canyon. It wasn't the most photogenic canyon I've been in. I made some some photos that I like. Um, when I'd read some trail guides, the the hikers that go there were like, "This is just as good as Antelope Canyon." Well, you know, <laughs> Antelope Canyon really it's is up for debate. Yeah, you, you know, Antelope Canyon is the standard by which all canyons are measured, and it's a beautiful canyon. And it's kind of too bad that it's become such a tourist experience. Uh, so it's nice to get into these lesser known canyons, even they're not quite as photogenic, even if they're not quite as beautiful as a place like Antelope Canyon. They are really still just amazing, magical places to be. Uh, and here's a self-portrait I took of myself while I was in the canyon. Uh, I don't look very happy in the picture. I was trying to be stoic <laughs> and manly. I can't really see your face, so I can't tell how unhappy or happy you are. Well, it's probably a good thing that you can't really see my face in the picture, though. You're Unfortunately, you have to see it live. Mm. Uh, so speaking of which, why don't we go to my video of me in Happy Canyon? We'll play that. And then up the video so that we have lots to choose from when we come back. Put a fun joke in there if you want. Yes, the funnier the comment, the better. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm professional photographer Ian Plant, and right now I'm in a beautiful slot canyon that is deep within the wilderness of the Utah desert. I had quite an adventure getting here. First, I had a two hour long white knuckle four wheel drive to get here, and then I had a four mile hike. I had to cross a river until I finally got into this canyon. The great news is, is I've got the whole place entirely to myself. It's really just an amazing, beautiful place and there's no one else here but me. This gives me a great opportunity to explore the canyon, to walk up and down, waiting for the perfect light to make a magical slot canyon photograph. Usually the best light in a slot canyon occurs during the middle of the day. You wanna photograph slot canyons on sunny days. You don't want clouds in the sky. You want that bright blue sunny sky that tourists love. And the reason you want this is then you end up getting this very strong sunlight on the rocks at the top of the canyon, and these rocks then glow in this light and act like giant reflectors and bounce that light deeper into the canyon. And that is where you get that magical orange-red canyon glow. Slot canyons are carved in sandstone, so there's a lot of striations, lines, and curves in the rocks that you can use as part of your compositions. I like working with my wide angle lens because it allows me to bring in all of those compositional features, the striations, the lines and the curves in the sandstone and bring those in as part of my overall visual design. Sometimes I even put on my fisheye lens, which allows me to go even wider and add some curvy goodness to the compositions. You typically want to avoid having any direct sunlight in your shots because that's gonna to create too much contrast and it's not gonna be very attractive. So I look for those parts of the canyon that are deep in shadow so there's no direct sunlight coming in, but still are getting a lot of that beautiful reflected bounce glow. It can be really dark, especially if you're in a deep, narrow slot canyon, even during that peak low light. So I often find that I prefer to bump up my ISO. I might increase my ISO to 200 or 400. That keeps my exposure times from being too long. Even at 200 or 400 ISO, I'll often end up with exposures that are several seconds long. By bumping my ISO up, I avoid those super long 15 or 30 second exposures, which just eat up a lot of time, and you're much less efficient when you're trying to get some shots fast. 
during that peak glow light. What I like to do is to explore the slot canyon walking up and down during the peak midday hours when the light's the strongest. And what I'm looking for is areas of the canyon that are kind of narrow that have that really strong glow. And I point my camera in the direction of that strongest glow. Wow, this has been an amazing day and an incredible photo adventure. I've had a great time photographing this beautiful slot canyon in the remote wilderness of the Utah desert. But it looks like my peak glow light is beginning to fade. So it's time for me to head out of here. I've got a long way to go, but I hope you found this video useful. I'm Ian Plant and thanks for watching. All right. And we're back. Okay, well, so- you put some fun questions in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you who were impressed by my slender and uh, tone physique, I called that the food poisoning diet, patent pending. And as I said, I was able to lose five pounds in three days. So it's a remarkable diet. I don't recommend it for anyone. But now I'd like to turn things over to you, the viewer. And we've got lots of exciting comments and questions coming in. So Lilia is going to pick the very best ones and read them off. The very best ones. Well, I'm going to do some pre-submitted ones first. Okay. So we're going to start out with one from Marco asking, what time of the year do you suggest visiting Patagonia? Ah, Marco, thank you. I love Patagonia. It's a place that I've been to many, many, many mm -hmm. times. I haven't been there recently. Uh, I think that the best times to go there are during the austral spring and the austral fall. So those occur, uh, if you want to be there in fall, uh, late March and early to mid-April are a great time to be there. You get some spectacular fall colors, especially in Argentina when you're in Los Glaciers National Park. Uh, you're not going to get as much fall color in uh, Torres del Pane National Park, which is in Chile, uh, because there's really not that many trees there anymore. Most of the trees were burned out when they had a wild uh, mm -hmm. fire several years back. Uh, so you get some spectacular fall colors, the Lenga trees that grow there. Uh, they, uh, the needles will turn color in the fall and they'll turn these beautiful yellows and reds. So there's actually really spectacular fall color, but you're going to see that mostly on the Argentina side of things. The flip side in the spring, so that's usually in the November or December time frame, you can actually get some wildflowers. Now, you don't get many Ooh. wildflowers in Argentina, but you will see wildflowers in Chile, in Torres del Pane. So both times are excellent times to go. I kind of like being in these cooler shoulder seasons uh, because if you're down there during the austral summer, I think there's a tendency to have more bad weather. I've heard of people going down there. Uh, like in January or February and just being completely shut out for weeks on end. Ooh. So I think when things are a little bit cooler, the weather tends to be a bit more variable and unstable. And you can often have periods of time where you'll have a few days and it's cloudy and windy and you can't really do any shooting, but then you're going to have a good chance of getting a stunning sunrise or sunset uh, at least once while you're down there if you spend enough time. When I, uh, I used to lead photo tours down to Patagonia, and the tours would always be 10 days. We'd spend five days in Argentina and five days in Torres del Pane. And the reason we did that was that pretty much guaranteed that we would have at least one day in each place where we would have really stunning sunrise or sunset conditions or both. Usually we got more than that, but it seemed to me that the five days in each place was a bit of a magic number to make sure that we got at least one good chance of getting photography at these iconic locations. Give yourself enough time. Yes, definitely. All right. Our next question is from Ryan asking, how would you go, go about or how do you go about keeping your gear protected from sand, water droplets, et cetera, et cetera, the elements, if you will? Ryan, thank you. That is a fantastic question. And people are usually shocked by my answer, which is I do practically nothing to protect my gear. As you probably already surmised, <laughs> considering how many times I've crashed my drones. Yeah, actually... why are you asking him? He's already <laughs> ruined like four drones. Clearly it's not a great, probably not a great maintenance of his property. Probably. So I, I'm a little bit better with my equipment. Uh, you, you know, I'm not too worried about sand so much. Uh, sand can be annoying. Uh, you get the grid inside your equipment. But more often than not, sand will work its way out. It doesn't cause any serious problems. So on occasion, I might get a grain of sand that works its way in and starts messing a with single grain. a single grain. It can maybe mess with some electronics or if you get it stuck under like your focus ring or something like that, you, there might be some problems until it eventually works its way out or breaks up. Um, but if I'm shooting in a sandy area, like, you know, sometimes in a slot canyon, there might be a lot of sand or you're out in the desert and there's sand. If there's any wind, 
Uh, one thing you want to make sure you do is you keep your camera bag closed at all times. So if I drop my camera bag down, I uh, get my equipment out and leave my camera bag somewhere and walk around with my camera on my tripod, I always make sure to zip up my camera bag because if you leave that bag open and you're shooting in a sandy environment, you, you may come back and the whole thing is just got sand completely in it covering all your equipment. So that's the best thing you can do is just make sure you zip up your camera bag. Um, and another thing you should be very careful about if you're working in sandy conditions and it's windy is just be careful when you're changing lenses. What I'll usually do is at the very least, I'll turn away from the wind and use my body to shield my equipment when I'm changing lenses. Or if I've got a jacket on, I'll change it underneath the jacket. That's just to keep sand from blowing into the open camera and getting on your sensor. Since we're talking about equipment, we have a few questions in the chat about the drone. Mm -hmm. um, one, how difficult is it to transport a drone through an airport? Are there any restrictions? How do you bring your drone through an airport? And also, too, are most drones allowed in national parks, or what are the restrictions there? Okay, I'll answer the second question first. So drones are not allowed in U.S. national parks okay. at all. But there's a lot of federal land out there that that isn't national park where you can use drones, like uh, BLM land, Bureau of Land Management land. That's where I do most of my shooting when I'm out in the desert. Uh, I like going to BLM land because there's usually no one else out there and uh, there's no restrictions on where you can go and what you can do with your drone. Uh, most national monuments are okay. If, if, it's a, if it's a national monument administered by the National Park Service, you might have problems, but a lot of the national monuments are administered by the Bureau of Land Management, so it's okay to fly there. National forests, same sort of thing. Uh, state parks vary. Some state parks allow you to fly, some don't. I, I like to fly in areas where there's not people around because I don't like bugging people with my drone. So I like going out. And <laughs> Some these... people get mad about it. They too. do. Yeah. They do. And, and I don't blame them. I mean, it's kind of noisy and it can be a little bit annoying. So um, I try to find places where it's both legal to fly and I'm also not going to bother people. And so that's why I gravitate to these BLM, BLM areas. Now, uh, these regulations vary country by country. I've been to other countries where it's okay to fly in their national parks. Uh, other countries follow the U.S. So you really have to do some research to find out ahead of time if it's okay to fly the drone where you're going. But no, uh, most national parks around the world, including in the U.S. and Canada, is not allowed to fly a drone inside the national park. Now, regarding the first question, transportation of the drone, uh, it's actually not that difficult to transport your drone. Um, the, the main regulation that you have to be concerned about when you're going through an airport is the fact that the drone has these big lithium batteries. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have, if a battery is not installed in a device, you're going to have to carry the battery with you on your carry-on. And there's a limit to how much physical lithium-ion battery you can carry with you. So what I do is I leave one of my batteries installed in the drone, and then I, I pack the drone in my luggage, and I lock the luggage with a TSA-approved lock. Uh, and um, I just carry on my spare battery one or two with me when I'm boarding the plane. Right. Other than that, it's really not problematic. Uh, you know, the drones, you you know, the drones will come in a nice styrofoam case, and I use that case when I'm flying. Keep that uh, secure. Yeah, I put the case inside another piece of luggage, or or you can also have a, a more durable hard shell case for your drone that you can use as well. Um, I've never tried to carry my drone on with me on the on the, the plane. Checked it. Yeah, I've always checked it. All right. All right. Our next question is from Barbara asking, what is the best way to take photos of flying or moving animals? Ah, interesting question. And thank you, Barbara. Uh, I guess it depends on, uh, you know, how you are taking the photos of the flying or moving animals. So if you're on the ground, uh, the best way to photograph a flying or moving animal is to make sure, first of all, that your autofocus is set to the predictive autofocus mode. So every camera has a predictive focus mode. It's called AI Servo on Canon. I forget what it's called with Nikon and every other system has a different thing. Uh, but that predictive autofocus mode tracks movement. So if you're, if you're with a moving subject, it's easier to lock on if you're using that predictive autofocus mode, especially if the subject is moving towards you or away from you. Um, and it, it also depends on whether the subject is flying across your field of view or moving across your field of view. In that case, you're going to want to hand with your subject. So you basically lock the lens on your subject and you try to move at the same rate that the subject is moving. It takes a little bit of practice to get that panning, movement, timing. steadying. Yeah, and you need good timing, exactly. 
Uh, so it can be a challenge. It's something you have to practice at. If the subject is running towards you, then it's easier to keep your camera locked on it. And then you have to trust with uh, your predictive autofocus that you're going to get that sharp focus as the animal's moving towards you. Now, the next variable is shutter speed. You want to make sure you get a sharp photo unless you're going for a more artistic blurred look. But if you want something sharp, you need a shutter speed that's fast enough to stop the motion of the animal. And it really depends how fast it's moving. So if it's a cheetah running across your field of view, uh, that's moving very fast. You're probably going to want one one thousandth of a second, maybe one two thousandth of a second to freeze that action. But if it's like a, a big hippopotamus that's the kind of lumbering towards you. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Well, ho hopefully you're in a vehicle. So, you, you know, you, you're not actually going to get trampled. Vehicles are actually like the most dangerous. They, they kill more people than any other animal. They, they are very Sorry, dangerous. A bit more yeah. Day, but I'm yeah. Just saying if you're photographing Thank a you hippo. for bringing us down. <laughs> now, now, now we're all worried about mortality in the hands of hippos. <laughs> they, they are very dangerous. Uh, they're also much faster than they look. Yeah. I remember their once, size, yeah. yeah, when I was in Zambia, I was on a photo safari and we were coming back and we were crossing the river at night and the guide suddenly had to you know, freak out and, and reverse the vehicle because there was a oh hippo, gosh. this big male hippo that came out of nowhere and it seemed to be charging right at us. It was ready. Yeah, it, it turns out offensive. it was. It turns out it was chasing away a smaller male hippo. Oh. But for about three or four seconds, we were we were all uh, very worried that we were about <laughs> to get eaten by this hippo. Is that um, your closest call? Do you have any other good animal chasing stories? Oh, I've got plenty of great animal chasing stories, but I'll pace them out. So, okay. you know, we've already had we'll the... We'll distribute them. Sprinkle them. Yes, yes. We've already had our, our food poisoning story for okay, this well. particular episode and our hippo story. Um, and so we'll, we'll just kind of leave that for our, our danger stories for today. But we'll have more danger stories in future episodes. <laughs> so uh, if the animal's moving a little bit slower, sorry for getting sidetracked there, um, you can get away with a shorter shutter speed. You know, my rule of thumb is usually when I'm shooting moving animals, I shoot at one five hundredth of a second at a minimum. And uh, I might work my way down lower if I'm working in lower light and I'm trying to, you know, keep my quality high by keeping my ISO low. I might go lower if, if I feel like the animal's not moving that fast and I can get away with it. But one five hundredth of a second or higher is a good place to start and experiment from there. All right. Our next question is from Bruce asking, how much of the work do you do in camera versus post-processing? Do you virtually ignore camera settings when shooting raw and do all of the work in post or some sort of combination? Oh, that's a, a great question. And it's a bit of a complicated question. Uh, so I'm going to do my, best, yeah, <laughs> do my best to answer it succinctly. Uh, I, I, I try to get my photos as good as possible in the field. You know, I'm not I'm not someone who likes to do a huge amount of Photoshop manipulation, but what that means kind of depends on your point of view because there are a lot of uh, landscape photographers in particular who are doing extreme Photoshop manipulation of their yeah. images. They're like changing skies, adding rainbows that weren't there. They're really creating digital painting. So that, that's one uh, possibility. That's one route that some people go. And that's not something I like to do. Uh, on the other hand, I do embrace the digital darkroom I think it gives you opportunities to optimize your image to make it, it look as good as it can. And I think there are some creative things that you can take advantage of. So white balance is one in particular that I'll often uh, change in, in my raw processing. And uh, the reason why I do it in raw rather than do it in the field is because it's a penalty free adjustment when you're in raw. There's no reason to change your white balance in the field because there's no loss of quality when you change it on your raw file. So I don't want to think about it when I'm in the field. I might preview in my mind what I think the final image will look like when I make my uh, post-processing white balance adjustment. But I don't, just don't worry about it in the field. I make that adjustment later on. And some other adjustments that I like to make uh, might be to exposure. And the reason I do that is when I'm in the field, I'm usually trying to optimize my digital file by pushing my exposure as far to the right as possible, giving it as much exposure without overexposing any of the highlights because this maximizes the quality of a digital file uh, because the, the noise that you see, that digital noise lurks in dark shadow areas. So if you get your exposure as far to the right of the histogram as bright as possible, then you have a cleaner, higher quality file. But that means that the image looks often too bright and too washed out. So you have to make uh, adjustments, sometimes extreme adjustments to contrast and do exposure when you're processing the raw file, darkening that image, adding contrast, getting it to the exposure level that you want, 
uh, to compensate for the fact that you have pushed your histogram so far to the right when you were in the field. So I, I do embrace digital darkroom techniques, and I'm hoping to be starting soon working on a course Ooh. that lays out my entire digital workflow. Uh, it might be something that's available in a few months. So keep an eye out for that, that. <laughs> uh, because it's going to have a, it's going to show my workflow, and I think there'll be some surprises for people. Uh, uh, in it, and I hopefully some very useful things. So keep an eye out for that. Our next question is from Joe saying, Hi, Ian, will you ever be leading, leading live workshops again? I really enjoyed the workshops I took with you in Grand Marais and Valley of Fire. Oh, well, thank you, Joe. I think I know which Joe this is. Uh, <laughs> I do appreciate the comment. I, I'm uh, retired from doing the, the workshops and tours right now because I wanted to focus on a broader educational mission through Outdoor Photography Guide and through my videos and my eBooks. Uh, I may on occasion come out for retirement, what I would like to do instead of leading like photo tours is to have some specialized uh, uh, photo workshops that focus on a particular aspect of, of photography, like composition or something like that, so that I have a real intense uh, teaching session with a small group of people. So I might be doing that on occasion. It's something I've been thinking about a lot recently. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. All right. Our next question is from Luke asking, what are your favorite locations in the U.S., the eastern United States to shoot? Do you have any favorite locations on the East Coast? Yes, I absolutely do, Luke. Thank you. That's a fantastic question. I grew up on the East Coast and I'm a recent transplant to the Midwest. So even though the western United States are truly stunning areas, uh, my heart really does uh, lie with a lot of the places that I, I love to photograph when I was out east. Of course, there's a lot of diversity on the eastern coast of the United States. Um, one of the areas I really enjoyed uh, exploring when I was young uh, and later going back to as a photographer as an adult was the Adirondack State Park in upstate New York. Hmm. Six million acres. It's the biggest park in the lower 48 states. Absolutely huge, and most people don't don't know it's there. Now it's a rugged backcountry. It's tough to get in there. Uh, the High Peaks region was one of my favorite places to go photograph. It's a lot of hard work, um, but there's some really cool places there. And then uh, when you get up in the Maine, obviously Acadia National Park is really fantastic. The coastal opportunities there are beautiful, but I also liked exploring other portions of the Maine coast. It's a very rocky coast, so there was a, a lot of great stuff up there. If you go farther south, you get into uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Appalachian Mountains, and I spent a lot of time photographing those areas. So Shenandoah National Park is, is pretty good, but it gets even better when you move down the Blue Ridge Parkway into North Carolina. In particular, you get into the highlands. There's some really beautiful, fantastic areas. Great Smoky Mountains National Park is obviously a fantastic place to photograph, but once you start moving into those big national parks, they get more crowded. It's more a little bit more, more touristy. Yeah, so it can often be difficult to go to places and find unique views. So I would explore the areas that were next to those really famous areas. There's a lot of national forest that you can find in um, a lot of parts of the East Coast. There's a surprising amount of federal land out there that is very accessible and less visited by other photographers. So there's more opportunities for getting unique photos. But there are plenty of beautiful places out east. Just get out there and start exploring and you will be amazed at what you can find. I spent three years doing a hardcover book uh, many years ago on the Chesapeake Bay. And I, I was amazed at the things that I was able to find that no one else knew about, that, that no other photographer was going out to photograph. I saw amazing wildlife, beautiful landscape scenery in an area that most people would think was about as flat and uninteresting as you can imagine. <laughs> so uh, I, I recommend no matter where you live, get out, just start exploring your local area and finding what's unique and special about it. You'll be amazed at what you can find. Just explore. All right, we have a question from Larry asking, have you had any experiences with birds of prey viewing and or attacking your drone? <laughs> Maybe that'll be how the fifth one goes out. Do I don't know. Yeah, so um, on occasion when I'm flying my drones, I'll, I'll suddenly get this collision warning. And I've often wondered, is that a bird that's flying towards the drone or something? <laughs> I, I actually think what's going on is I'm getting flare off of the sun oh. that's messing with the sensors. I don't think a bird of prey has ever actually attacked my drone. Um, 
Uh, but uh, I wish it would. That'd be a great story. Yeah, that would be a great story, <laughs> I guess. Well, it depends on how it ends up, you know, like true. If, if the drone and the bird become friends, then it's a story we could all appreciate. But if it, it turns into an ugly fight and one of the two gets destroyed, then that's not a story I'm going to wish to share. But no, <laughs> I have, I've never had a bird attack my drone. Uh, and usually I'm flying in areas. You know, I, I certainly that's another consideration as I think about how my drone might affect wildlife. So I try to avoid flying it over any like large gatherings of birds or anything like that because i know that the drone could spook them so i'm trying to be cognizant not only of people but of how animals and wildlife will react to the drone so no we have not had a bird of prey attack no 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 not attacks yet. On drones. Yes. Not yet. no one no birds have attacked my drone and no one has tried to shoot my drone All so right, there you I'm, go. I'm doing well our next question is from janice who asks how do you keep the sun from blowing out in your photos and cj adds you'd have to blow pretty hard to blow out the sun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you, CJ, for uh, adding a comic list to uh, what is otherwise a very uh, sober question. And what she adds, though, he oh, Janice adds, she has a lot of hot air, so I don't know what she could do. <laughs> well, Janice, uh, I, I can assure you that no matter how much hot air you have, it's nowhere near <laughs> compared to how much hot air I have, uh, which is why I'm doing this show, <laughs> because I just have, I can't stop talking. But so shooting into the sun is a challenge when you're shooting with digital. So back in the days of film, film would handle the blown out highlights a lot better, but digital has this problem. Not only do the highlights go pure white, but there's this also this phenomenon called bloom where that overexposure spreads out into the surrounding pixels and it can be really unattractive. So there's a few things that I do when I'm making photographs to try to minimize this, to mitigate this as much as possible. First of all, I usually photograph the sun when it's relatively low in the sky. So when it's lower near the horizon, uh, there's a different kind of atmosphere that's scattering the light. So the, the sun is much less in, intense. It's much more colorful. So it's easier to photograph the sun then and not get that huge overexposure around the sun. Now, no matter what you do, the sun itself is going to be overexposed. Even when I photographed the sun during a total eclipse, it, the sun itself was still overexposed. You know, you could see the, the moon in front of the sun and that was black. But all of the corona <laughs> the around, around, yeah, the ring around it was overexposed. There was nothing you can do about it. The sun is just really, really, really super bright. But if you shoot during those times when there's some haze or some atmospheric interference when the sun's low, you'll get less of the surrounding parts of the sun from overexposing. Another thing I do is I often partially block the sun with a mountain or a cloud or a tree limb or something like that. That helps reduce the intensity so you don't get as much flare and you don't get that digital bloom, that overexposure. And the third thing is you just have to be very careful with your exposure. Once again, you can never really avoid overexposing the sun. I mean, you can, but you'll end up with a, a photograph that's so dark, everything else will, will be black. <laughs> but you can control your exposure to avoid having large portions of the sky around the sun be overexposed. And so when you're shooting into the sun, uh, back in the old days to control exposure, photographers would use graduated neutral density filters. You know, you pull the filter over the sky, and the dark half of the filter darkens the sky and that helps balance the exposure so you can still get some detail in the shadowed areas. Nowadays, a lot of photographers prefer to do exposure blending to achieve that same effect, but to do it in a more natural way. So these are ways you can control the exposure of the sky better to avoid having that area around the sun blown out. Next question is from Anhil asking, hi Ian, how do you get front to back focus? Do you use photo stacking or do you use tilt shift lenses? Uh, fantastic question. It seems like we get this question every time. Everyone wants to know how to get that sharp, deep focus effect. And unfortunately, every time, I, instead of giving the answer, because the answer <laughs> is incredibly long, I always refer people to my course, Focusing for Landscape Photography, which is available on the Outdoor Photography Guide shop. It tells you everything you need to know from focus stacking to hyperfocal distance uh, uh, in using depth of field. It even talks about tilt shift lenses. Tilt shift lenses are a great way of getting that deep focus effect. Unfortunately, there is a limited number of tilt shift lenses out there and they have very specific focal lengths. So uh, they're not a viable option for most people in the field because you might prefer to have like a wide angle zoom and all you can 
do if you've got a tilt shift lens is you're stuck with that particular focal length. But they do allow you to change the uh, the axis of the lens plane, which allows you to get that deep focus effect for a bunch of technical reasons I'm not going to go into. Focus stacking is something that I do a lot. It's something that I've embraced recently uh, because it, it gives you a sharper look for the overall image than you can get from using hyperfocal distance and depth of field. Uh, and it, it also gives you the ability to extend focus beyond what you could ever achieve using depth of field alone. So it really enhances your artistic opportunities. Uh, but unfortunately, it's also a slow process that requires not anything moving during your exposure. So if you're working really fast or you've got a lot of moving elements that you would later have to put together on the computer, uh, it's good to know how to do hyperfocal distance focusing and use depth of field. So I would say that probably about 50 to 60 percent of the time I'm still focusing the old fashioned way using depth of field and hyperfocal distance uh, when I'm doing landscape work. And maybe about 30% of the time, sometimes 40% of the time, I'll actually sit down and do focus stacking. Uh, so these are all methods that are described in great detail in my course, Focusing for Landscape Photography. I highly recommend that you buy it. It will demystify the entire process, <laughs> teach you everything you need to know. Everything you need to know. Mm -hmm. About focusing for landscape photography. <laughs> Very specific. Our next question is from Tim asking, if you had only seven to 10 days to visit two or three Southwestern national parks, where would you go? Mm. Okay, well, that is a very difficult question. Um, you have to pick. Go I have to your pick. Head. Well, first of all, I probably avoid the national parks, but that's just me. Uh, if, if it came down to my favorite national parks in the Southwest, I think that um, you probably would do very well if you did Zion, Bryce, well, those two probably could take up a lot of your time. They're really fantastically beautiful parks. Uh, and, and Death Valley, Death Valley, Zion, and Bryce, they're all relatively close to each other. And I think that that probably gives you a fair amount of diversity and it allows you to see some really amazing things. But there are so many beautiful national parks in the Southwest. You know, I haven't even, you know, if you do those three, uh, you're, you're avoiding like the Moab area, for example, where you've got Arches National Park and Canyonland. And that's a really nice seven to 10 day combination of shooting on those two parks because of the central location of Moab. And you're actually pretty close to the Grand Canyon. So that's another possibility as well. But the great thing about the desert Southwest is there's so much to do and see. There's so many national parks, but there's so much amazing BLM, national forest, national monument, and national wildlife refuge land that the national parks aren't even the best that that there is there. I mean, the national parks are amazing there, but there's so much else to do and see. And the great thing about getting away from the national parks is you avoid the crowds and you avoid the crush of photographers that show up. I mean, if you go to a place like Delicate Arch in Arches National Park, you go up to photograph Delicate Arch at sunset, you'll probably see two or 300 people up there with tripods. Ooh. It's absolutely insane. Whereas some of the places I was going to that were, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 miles away from that location that were outside of the national park, there was no one around. And I had this beautiful area all to myself. I could do anything I wanted. So it's, it's you know, I strongly encourage the people, uh, don't just go to the national parks. The national parks are amazing, but there's so much to do there that you'll never, ever find a dull moment. If you are going on, this is just a question for me, on a seven to, seven to 10 day sort of trip, would you prefer to visit like three places? Or just try and take lots of photos in one spot. Do you so, like to hit a lot or stay in one? You know, my, my personal philosophy is to stay in an area and mm -hmm. work it for a long period of time. Uh, you know, I constantly tell people that I go on photo trips with. Sometimes I'll, I'll travel with another photographer that if I go to a place, I'm going to want to stay there for at least a week or two because that gives you get a chance a to get a feel for it, yeah. to explore it, to find those unique compositions. And the thing about you know landscape photography in particular is that it's so dependent on the weather and the light. You know, it takes time to find those, those unique, compelling compositions, but then you have got to wait. Sometimes you have to wait a mm -hmm. long period of time for the light and the clouds to complement that scene. So I prefer to go deep with just one area. And I may spend as much as two or three weeks in the same place photographing that area until I get it right. So that's Perfect that's my person. Spot. Yeah. Just curious. Yep. Question from Diedrich asking, what do you take with you for gear on a hiking trip without electricity? Oh, 
Fantastic question, uh, Diedrich. And uh, so one thing that you should bring with you if you're on an extended wilderness trip and you don't have access to electricity is a small portable solar panel with a battery that you can charge up from the solar panel. And I should have a video coming out that will be on the Outdoor Photography Guide site relatively soon that uh, talks about uh, how I use the solar panel when I was in Ethiopia to make sure that my devices were charged. So what I had to do is buy a third party battery charger that connects to a USB so that I could charge up my Canon camera battery. Um, but I could use the solar panel, I'd let it charge all day, and then the auxiliary battery would, would power up, and then I could charge two or three camera batteries and my phone and my iPad using the auxiliary battery and so I always have power. So that is a key thing is to make sure, because that way, otherwise you have to carry a bunch of batteries. And if you run out of it power- Weighs down your hiking then. Yeah, it weighs you down. <laughs> yeah, it weighs you down. You've got all that lithium bouncing around on, it, on itself. Uh, that's a fire hazard. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you run out of the batteries that you bring with you, then you're done. So this way you can always stay charged and keep going. All right. I'm not sure if we answered this in our drone discussion earlier, but it was asked again. Um, Ian, how do you determine where you want to fly your drone? How do you determine where you want to fly your drones if it's legal? Uh, like, do you have any place you fact check your information before you go? Well, OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, there are a number of sites where you can check. Uh, there, There is a blog. I, I'm not exactly sure the name of it, but there is a drone based blog that mm -hmm. gives you uh, the most current up-to-date information regarding the legality of flying drones in countries and parks all around the world. So that's a useful resource. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, when you have a drone, like uh, DJI, for example, the manufacturer of my drone, they actually have a database, a fly safe database. You can download an app you, just to check to see if you can fly. Because uh, obviously it's not just a question of uh, national park versus BLM land or something like that. Sometimes you might be close to an airport that you don't realize and you're not allowed to fly your drone there. There might be local uh, and state regulations regarding certain areas. So you can check the fly safe database to see if it's okay. Uh, uh, most of the drones will tell you when you take off, you know, like with my DJI drone, if I'm in an area where I'm not supposed to fly, it'll say you can't fly here and it won't take off. Or it'll give me a warning, like there's an unpaved airport nearby, so fly with caution. You're, it's okay to fly here, but you just got to be careful, that sort of thing. Um, and in terms of, you know, I'm going to answer the question a different way as well. In terms of deciding where I want to fly, I spend a lot of time poring over satellite maps. You can go to Google Maps or Bing Maps or, you know, your, the map app on your phone, and you can pull up a satellite view, and I zoom into the satellite view so that I'm close enough to approximate what it would look like when I'm flying my drone over it. And I use that to find areas that, that might be interesting, that might have a lot of raw material for my aerial composition. So I, I actually spend a ton of time before I go to an area looking at the satellite maps to find good raw material for my drone photography. A lot of drone conversation going on in the chat. So We've been another... droning on quite a bit. <laughs> oh, oh, boo. Another question from Fran asking, what factors should one consider in buying a drone? Uh, so for me, Fran, thanks, is a great question. The primary factor for me was the image quality. So mm -hmm. I chose the DJI Phantom 4 Pro, which I, you know, I smashed a few of those, the most recent. A few. Yeah, I've got, I replaced that most recently with the Phantom 4 Advanced, which is, got the same camera and sensor as the Pro, but it's a little bit cheaper. Uh, so I decided, well, if I'm gonna be breaking these every month or two, that I might as well save a few hundred bucks each time <laughs> I replace it by going with the cheaper one. Uh, so that was my primary consideration. So right now, the biggest uh, camera sensor you can get on a, one of these uh, 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 kind of uh, enthusiast drones uh, is uh, the, the 20 megapixel one inch sensor that you find on the DJI Phantom 4 Pro and advanced and so that's the biggest one out there. Most of them are smaller than a one inch sensor. A one inch sensor is not very big. Um, it's the kind of sensor you see in a lot of point and shoot cameras. It's big enough where I can, I can do large like 24 by 36 inch prints that'll look good, uh, but it, it's not gonna have the same image quality as a, a DSLR sensor. Uh, there are drones out there like professional drones that are much, much more expensive that have bigger sensors like DJI Inspire, their most recent camera has a uh, APS-C size sensor. So it's the crop sensor DSLR, and that's fantastic image quality. Uh, but we're looking at like $6,000 for the drone and the camera. And right now I can't afford $6,000 every month because I'm guaranteed to smash that thing. So. <laughs> 
So the, the most realistic options, uh, the highest quality you can get right now is that 20 inch sensor. But I, I, I wanna make sure I get the highest quality photos I possibly can. And so that's what I look for. Since we're, we're still on it, I'm gonna throw in one more question about drones here from Janice. Is there insurance for drones or do you get insurance on your drones? Yes, I do have insurance for my drone through my general business insurance. Uh, I recently put in a claim for the drone that I lost in Ethiopia, this most, this most recent crash. I decided <laughs> not to make a claim with my insurance company because I'm pretty sure they'll drop me <laughs> if I'm making that many claims. Yeah. Um, I did notice I haven't looked into it, but I thought I saw an email a few weeks ago uh, from a company that was advertising uh, $10 a day drone insurance. Like you hmm. buy insurance when you're planning to fly your drone. So I haven't oh. looked into it. Uh, I might've been dreaming about it. Maybe it was just something that I thought <laughs> was really cool. Thinking. Yeah. And I'm not sure how they police it because, you know, I could see crashing my drone then going to my computer and saying, oh, time to buy drone today insurance today. Insurance. Yeah. yeah. So they, they must have a method for policing it to make sure people aren't cheating. But that sounds like a really good option because, uh, you know, I might I, I might look into it and just buy insurance for the time that I'm out shooting and not have the insurance for when my drone is sitting at home. And uh, having a company that's dedicated to drone insurance means probably less likely to get all sorts of hassles when you do crash your drone, even if you if you crash it frequently. Whereas, you know, like a State Farm or Nationwide or other insurance company that doesn't have much experience with this sort of thing will probably freak out if they do cover <laughs> your drone after you make your first claim. So I have heard about people losing their equipment insurance when they've made claims. And I think part of the reason is because a lot of these insurance companies don't have a lot of experience with photography. And so they don't want to take the risk. All right. I just want to reiterate some stuff that's been going on in the chat. Anya's been doing a great job at answering, but this will be available to watch after. If you missed any of the live event or if you want to go back and watch anything, it will be on the Outdoor Photography Guide website. So feel free to check it out after the fact. And I thought I'd ask one more question that All has right. been going on in the chat. I have avoided it thus far, but it's pretty humorous. <laughs> Did you run into any cow pies while you were tracking your cow tracks? Did you step any? Did you have to cover any up? So certain <laughs> certain places in the world, stepping in poop is pretty much inevitable. And uh, my trip to Ethiopia, for example, there was a lot of livestock there. And I tried my very best to avoid stepping in the poop, but it was impossible. As a matter of fact, me and uh, my photography buddy, Vincent Grafhorst, who I was with, we started playing a game, uh, who made the poop? Um, <laughs> because there was a huge variety. And the American Southwest is another place where uh, cow pies are inevitable and uh, you do your best not to step in them, but there's there's different stages of cow pie. There's fresh and then there's fossilized. And then there's, yeah. yeah, then there's in between. And the stuff that's fossilized or kind of approaching fossilization might look like a rock. You might think you're safe <laughs> and then you realize you've stepped in Maybe cow pie. Maybe it blends into your photo better than it yeah, looks like an old rock. That's true. And as a matter <laughs> of fact, if the cow pie is old and fossilized enough, it might actually be useful as an interesting compositional element because no one's going to know what, what it is. Well, thank you. Uh, this has been a great session. I have a feeling that we had hundreds and hundreds of people watching today. We were getting bombarded with questions. So I'm sorry that we didn't answer everyone's question, but these were some fantastic questions. You guys are great. We're having a lot of fun. Can't <laughs> wait for our next episode yeah. of OPG Live. And we're hoping to spice things up. And I am hoping that we'll be able to interview another professional photographer. So stay tuned for information on the next episode of OPG Live. I'm Ian Plant. And I'm Lilia Khalif. And thanks for watching. Bye.